Several years ago, we observed some interesting phenomena while we were conducting some gas electrolysis experiments. Since that time, we have conducted hundreds more experiments, arriving at a device that we call the Lattice Energy Converter. This presentation updates previous presentations and publications. In previous presentations and publications about the LEC, we've included plots of current and power versus load resistance and temperatures. While the information in those plots is important, I don't think they have the impact that actually seeing a LEC assembled and started the test will have. That's what we're going to show in the following video. The working electrode is a standard 8 inch by 4 inch iron pipe nipple that's been co-deposited with palladium. The counter electrode is a half inch by 6 inch galvanized pipe nipple. The voltage produced as a function of resistance from open circuit, which is about 10 megohms, will be about 700 millivolts, to short circuit about 100 ohms, which is about 0 0.06 millivolts, and these are recorded two times a second. Based on the voltage produced for each load resistance, the current and power can be calculated as well as lower bound on the number of ions being produced per second. For this test, I'm going to demonstrate a load test of a LEC. The instrumentation we have is a digital voltmeter that is optically connected to the computer, and we're recording the voltages twice a second here. It may be easier to read here than on, on the screen. We have this resistance substitution box, which has ranges from uh, 1 mega ohm down to 10 ohms. The working electrode for this test is a 1 8 inch by 4 inch iron pipe that has been co-deposited with palladium. It's screwed into a couple here, which is connected to this pipe here, which is epoxied into the back of this fitting so that it has electrical isolation between the fitting and the working electrode. The counter electrode is a pipe. You can see it's empty. I'm just going to screw it in. And I'm going to connect the red lead from the voltmeter to the working electrode and the black lead from the voltmeter to the counter electrode. And you see when we do that, we're measuring almost 700 millivolts, seven tenths of a volt. This is through a 10 mega ohm load. I'm going to now connect the resistance substitution box in parallel with the load and, and the cell and you see that it drops to about 430 mega ohms. I'm going to now switch this to the millivolt scale which will give us higher resolution as we go down. And you see we're somewhere a little over 400 millivolts at one mega. I'll leave this for a few seconds. Okay, now we're at 680 K ohms. You see it going down a little. Uh, I could let it stabilize, but that makes this a lot longer. I think I'll just switch it more frequent. At 470K, you can see the voltage drop. At 330K. At 220K. One hundred K ohms. Sixty eight K. Forty seven K.
33K. Twenty two K ten K six point eight K four point seven K Three point three K two point two K one thousand ohms six hundred and eighty ohms. Four hundred and seventy ohms. 330 ohms, 220 ohms, 100 ohms, 47 ohms, and with the resolution of this voltmeter, uh, it can't sustain, we don't, aren't able to measure below 47 ohms. Let's switch back and go back to the 1 mega ohm scale and you see that it builds right back up to where we started and in some cases it even goes higher after I've done one of these tests than it was originally. Before I describe the data shown on this slide, I want to say that I replaced the codepositive working electrode shown in the video with a bare iron pipe nipple in the same dimensions as one shown in the video. And as physics predict, the resistance between the electrodes was overload for the voltmeter and any voltages that might have been produced were well below the sensitivity of the voltmeter. This plot shows the current that is calculated from that previous test using Ohm's law and the power that is produced by multiplying the current times of voltage. As you can see when in the video, when we were at, at 100K, for example, the voltage, there were several voltages, and each time we switched voltage down, we would see some transition, which is why we have the data plotted this way. Below, we have calculated the power by multiplying the current times of voltage. And notice that the scale over here goes down five orders of magnitude. So we really don't see what the power is for these lower resistance areas. This is a log log plot of the same data as the previous slide, which shows the drop off in power while the current remains relatively constant. The output peaked at slightly less than one microamp of current and 250 nanowatts of power. A company in Florida advertises a P100 nanotritium battery that uses 225 millicuries of tritium. While the data on their website is limited, it appears that the P100 nanotritium battery produces approximately the same energy as the LEC in this test. Scaling the nanotritium battery to 1 watt would require more than 200,000 curies of tritium radiation. Concepts for nuclear batteries have been around for more than 50 years but the large radiation requirement has limited their development to special cases such as the thermoelectric snap reactors which have several kilograms of radioactive material and are used for space applications. In the case of the LEC, we believe there are several opportunities for, to scale up the output without requiring radioactive materials. We have selected three representative cell designs to show the versatility of the LEC and also demonstrate some of the features. If the working electrode is emitting high energy particles, for example, alphas or protons, we know that the ionized gas will be based on the Bragg curves where 90% of the ions will be 
be produced in the last 10% of their travel. For that reason, we designed this cell with alternating fins of copper and zinc to position the electrodes where the ions would be produced. It's also possible to working electrode produce gamma radiation, which could also impact the electrodes and produce uh, ions via the photoelectric effect. This slide shows plots of the voltage produced at temperatures over time, which is on the horizontal axis. As you can see, as the temperatures increased from roughly room temperature to about 340 degrees Kelvin, the absolute values of the voltage between the copper to zinc fins and the copper fins to the working electrode increased. Note that there's a lag between the temperature measured by the thermocouple outside the cell and the change in voltage, which we attribute to the lag in the temperature change within the cell. We don't know if these results are produced by the volta or contact potential difference effect or the photoelectric effect or combination thereof. Based on experimental results, we suspected that much of the ionizing radiation was being produced by a few localized active spots. We designed this cell to test that, whereas we had the working electrode centered between two counter electrodes that were separated by a PVC couple. As shown, when we connected the voltmeter between the two counter electrodes, we measured 150.5 millivolts. When we tied the two counter electrodes together and measured between the, those and the working electrode, we measured about 190 millivolts. Individual counter electrode measurements to the working electrode produced 170 millivolts and 20 millivolts respectively, and therefore the voltage between the two counter electrodes was 150 millivolts as shown. The voltage asymmetry indicates that the working electrode is not uniformly producing ionizing radiation along its length, and that the ionizing radiation is produced by a few active local sites. Another interesting observation from this cell and the previous glass cell is that the working electrode does not need to be physically connected, such as with a wire, to the counter electrode. The working electrode is a source of the energy to ionize the gas, and it does not need to be attached to a source of electrons. This fact could have significant implications for some cell designs. For example, in a space application, the working electrode could be particulates that are suspended within the gas, producing their ions that are then harvested by counter electrodes of different work functions. Based on a paper by Johnson Mathy that more hydrogen will diffuse into and through a palladium electrode if the hydrogen is moving over the surface, we constructed a cell with stainless steel screen that was co-deposited with PDH and we blow gas that includes hydrogen into the center and along the outside of the screen. In one design, the ionized gas is blown out of the cell. Medical applications, including a relatively new field that uses coal plasmas of various gases to treat burns, skin cancers, and other medical applications, is one example. In the cell design at the bottom, the ions are blown through an alternating work function fin structure to harvest the ions. We believe this design could reduce the loss of ions to internal cell shunt current, as well as reducing the number of ions that recombine. This slide shows an alternative fin structure for the previous cell design, and that this one includes a magnetic field that is perpendicular to the motion of the ions, causing the positive ions to deflect in one direction and the negative ions in the other. Some preliminary analysis indicates that reducing the loss to shunt current and recombination could result in two to three orders of magnitude improvement in cell output. As shown in the load test, a LEC can produce a voltage and current through a load. However, we need to increase the output by six to 10 orders of magnitude for commercial applications. I've targeted several areas here for those improvements. For example, increasing the number and density of the active sites. We believe you can do this with de better metallurgy and have allocated two to three orders of magnitude as a target improvement here. Another area is to improve the cell design that optimizes the collection of the ions before they recombine or before they're part of a shunt current. 
Our analysis indicates that there are two to three orders of magnitude improvement available here if we can optimize separation distance, things like blowing ionized particles between electrodes of different work functions, blowing ionized particles between electrodes in the presence of a magnetic field, incorporating solid state devices such as alpha or beta voltaic devices, and capturing the ionization energy in the gas, which is approximately 35 eV per ion pair that's formed. Another area is to increase the operational temperature. We have conducted tests from room temperature to approximately 200 degrees C, where we observed four orders of magnitude increase. And the increase is exponential with temperature. So here we say two to five orders of magnitude as a target improvement there. Another is increased electrode size. Our current electrodes are on the order of 30 to 35 square centimeters. And increasing that by two to three orders of magnitude within cell design appears to be possible. Improved analysis and theoretical understanding to support the optimized cell designs will help. We need to identify the source and type of ionizing radiation emitted from the working electro. Identify the, ro identify the role that the counter electrode may play in ionizing the gas. For example, is there a photoelectric effect? Identify gas mixtures that optimize the production of ions. And analyze the ion physics within the cell. Basically, to do this, we need to solve a fourth order nonlinear differential equation that has been known since J.J. Thompson, but has never been solved. We also need to understand where the energy in the lattice comes from. This is a lattice energy converter. So if we're producing energy out, we either have to supply energy from outside or L, E, and R could supply that energy. Here I've listed some additional thoughts and observations. A LEC has demonstrated the ability to self-initiate and self-sustain the production of a voltage and current. Biological systems self-initiate and self-sustain the production of low energy nuclear transmutations. What can we learn by studying biological systems? Another thing is that the LEC is a gaseous electronics device that involves a fourth order nonlinear differential equation. And that does not consider how the gas is being ionized or where or how the ions are produced. A good mathematical description and model is required to optimize the LEC. We need to understand why the LEC cells may change polarity over time. Several people ourselves and some of the replications that people have conducted have done this. This could be a result of the fourth order nonlinear differential equation, but we don't know. And the LEC is easy to instrument and provides sensitivity in the nanowatt range. The best calorimeters are not sensitive enough to detect these energy levels. These results suggest that LENR might be much more pervasive than calorimeters can detect. This slide lists some of the supplemental information on the LEC that's available online. The presentation that we gave in India in January 2021 and at ICCF 23 in June of 2021 can be found online at these links. Additionally, we have three patents, the electrolysis reactor system, the gaseous phase ionizing radiation generator, and the most recent patent is the lattice energy conversion device that was issued on January 25th of this year. We have two papers. One it has been published in the Journal of Condensed Matter Nuclear Science, and the second one that is in review and we can provide that by request. Also, we've been working on a draft working paper of the analysis and the LEC performance challenge working paper. We can make that available on request. Thank you for your interest. We welcome your comments and your questions.